Orson Welles speaking. How would you like to stay just as young as you are, not to grow a day older for the next 200 years? Oh, I'm not plugging some new miracle cosmetic. The question is actually faced by the characters in our story, two men and a girl. The eternal triangle plus eternal youth equals a wacky little romance, which we'll bring you, if we may, in just a few seconds. I hope you enjoy it. Back in the 20s, Dr. Humphrey Baxter was hailed as the discoverer of a scientific fountain of youth. But wait, let's start off with a girl in the case. Here she is. This, of course, is Caroline Coates, the world-famous actress. Well, actress is a word some of you may question, for she was not, strictly speaking, an actress at all. Caroline was simply one of those creatures who stands for something greater than talent, greater than beauty, and who is universally adored. A privileged few, of course, adored Carolyn at close range in, if you'll excuse the expression, in the flesh. One of these was Alan Brody, the tennis champion. Here he is. Now, science tells us that men of this type fall quickly and painlessly in and out of love. Others, like Dr. Baxter, here he is again, are men born for one passion only, at the most two, a passion for their job and for one woman. They never give up. Men of this type frequently devote themselves to science, and if they're interested in certain functions of the glands, this often takes them to Vienna. Wait a minute. We're getting uh, ahead of ourselves. Before going to Vienna, Humphrey Baxter spent an evening in New York. His friends, the Morgans, took him to the theater to see a show which was also very indirectly concerned with the glands. Humphrey leaned forward in his seat. The moment passed unnoticed because everyone else in the theater also leaned forward. Do you happen to know that girl, he asked his friends. Why, Humphrey, they said. How would people like us ever get to know anybody like Carolyn Coates? Humphrey realized that it needs only two or three introductions to bridge the gap between oneself and anyone anywhere in the world. So he asked everyone he knew, stating his purpose very clearly. And sure enough, not long after that, there he was in fashionable Long Island, talking to Carolyn Coates. He found her amazingly ignorant of the immense importance of recent scientific research. And you can imagine the effect of this gaunt, gauche young man lecturing a popular idol of 23 on the ductless glands. Carolyn's smart friends were amused and then amazed, for she had fallen head over heels in love. Who are you calling, dear? Lettie Popper. Who? The gossip columnist. Hello, Lettie. I want you to be the first to know we're getting oh, married. Wonderful, darling. Who is it? Baxter, the grand man. The grand man. Oh, bland. Well, Carrie, how nice for you. I think I mentioned that the title of this rather crazy little love story is uh, The Fountain of Youth. Well, of course, there are all sorts of fountains. Some are beautiful, some are purely mythological, some are silly fountains. It was near a silly fountain that the mythological Narcissus was drowned. It was his own reflection he fell for, and he fell in. Of course, the silliest of all is The Fountain of Youth. Old Ponce de Leon thought that one was somewhere down in Florida. This was three centuries before the invention of Miami Beach. And he aged a whole lot looking for it, which is only human. Almost all of us wish we were just a little younger than we are. Ladies quite late in their 70s can be heard addressing each other as girls. Very rich old ladies, even rich old gents have squandered fortunes on monkey glands and I don't know what all and the wistful hope of turning the clock back or at least slowing it up a bit and this field of course was Humphrey's specialty and by now Humphrey really had to go back to Vienna to continue his researches with Vingelberg. Vingel who? asked Caroline. Berg said Humphrey. Berg. The Vingelberg, the greatest of all authorities on the ductless glands. Oh said Caroline. Oh and how long are you going to be away with us? Dingleberg, sweetie. Three years. Three years. On the other side of the ocean. Yeah. 
I wish you'd change your mind. Darling, I'd like to get married now just as much as you would, but... But I simply cannot walk out on a new show and leave everybody flat. Besides... I know, you're in a smash hit and you love it. I know you think I'm just greedy to have a fuss made over me. I never suggested such a thing. But that's what you think. And if you didn't, you'd be crazy. Because I am just a little. But I promise you, darling, if I ever feel it's getting a real hold on me... And what do you think a real hold feels like? Like this? Humphrey's boat sailed, and Caroline was more idolized than ever. Of course, everyone expected to fall in love, but... First year passed, second year passed, third year wore on, and Caroline was still faithful. And there were two excellent reasons for this. She was so extremely fond of Humphrey, and she was so extremely fond of herself. And when the three years were over, Humphrey Baxter was on the boat, and the boat was docking. Now, for weeks, he'd had a picture in his mind of how she'd looked, and since this was in the 1920s, he'd costumed her in silver fox and violets. And on the landing dock, he saw plenty of fur and flowers, but no sign of Carolyn. Only two people were there to meet him, the Morgans. Welcome home, said Mr. Morgan. Where is she, asked Humphrey. No answer. Well, come on, where's Caroline? Still no answer. Was she sick? He said no. Miss Coates wasn't sick. The truth was, she'd fallen in love. Humphrey closed his eyes. He might have been asleep or dead. Who is he? Well, it all happened so quickly, just a week or so ago. Who is he? Alan Brody. The tennis champion. Yeah. Na na national singles eight, is eight times? The last six years in succession. Yeah, last six years. Oh, he's terrific. Popular idol. You mean like Carrie? He's a beautiful creature, Humphrey. He gives people the same sort of thrill that Carrie does. The two of them as a couple. Oh, you'll just have to wait till you see them together. I can wait. Humphrey was good at waiting. But in New York, it's seldom necessary to wait very long for anything. And he ran into the ideal couple very soon in a restaurant. Look! Look! Here comes the lover! What lover? He's lover! Oh, well! Hello, Mr. Humphrey. Hello, Mr. Humphrey. Alan, you know I'm not to back this. How do you do? Well, what do you think of him, Humphrey? Oh, really, Carolyn, don't ask. <laughs> Or am I being a little tactless? <laughs> well, I think you're both charming. Come on, dear, look at the camera. We've got to get a picture of you. Come on, take it quick. <laughs> I hope we'll be good friends. After your honeymoon's over, you must bring your young man around and see me. We'd love to. It won't be for two months, at least. I can wait. And Humphrey did some more waiting. Did a great deal of it, a great deal of thinking while he waited. And then just before Alan and Caroline were due back from their honeymoon, Humphrey called up a man named Morgan. Morgan speaking. This was his old friend Albert Morgan, whose profession was to turn the cloudy mutterings of scientists into clear, downright, and extremely thrilling articles for the weekly magazines. Sure, Humphrey. But three months ago, I, when I was after some information about your experiments, why, you clammed up on me. What? You heard from Ringelberg? Yes, about some tests we started in Vienna just before I left. This is news, Albert. Big news. So if you'd like to hear about 20 carefully chosen words... Hold it, hold it. I'll be right over. Quite remarkable what Morgan could do with 20 carefully chosen words. The news broke that keen-eyed endocrinologist Humphrey Baxter had finally succeeded in isolating VB-282. VB-282. Now, as I understand it, that's the glandular secretion that controls... Let me say that word again. Controls the aging of the tissues. Girls, just imagine what that means. And now to flash from the world of science to show business, a little bird tells me that Carolyn and Alan Brody are due back any day from their honeymoon. The ideal couple very soon dropped around to Humphrey's laboratory. Darling, cried the bride, you've become famous. What's all this about eternal youth? 
Humphrey told us she could have no interest in that. Why, you looked 18 when I met you, he said. And you were 23. Now you're 26. 27. 27 last week. And she still looks 18, said Humphrey. Well, said Brody, I can't say I've noticed myself slowing up any, but some of these youngsters from the West Coast... And he shook his head with a melancholy always induced in tennis players by a mention of the West Coast. You won't be young always, of course, but then you'd hardly want to be. Those people you see around who never seem to mature, they belong to a particular frigid narcissistic type. What kind of type? Narcissistic. From Narcissus. It means they're in love with themselves. They can't love anybody else, so that's why they never seem to get any older. Yes. Yes, but what about the stuff you've discovered? Oh, that. It's not true, then? I told you it was all a lot of hooey. Listen, I'm going to tell you something no one in the world must know about. Do you understand that, Brody? Well, you can rely on me. Very well. Oh, a little kitten cat. Isn't he sweet? But what's the kitten got to do with your experiments? The kitten had a birthday last week. It was five years old. Ah! It's a dwarf or, or a midget or something. It's as normal as any kitten you ever saw in your life. But what'll happen to it? Will it go on forever? Will it, will it go off bang or, or crumble into dust or something? Almost surely heart failure. But only after 60 years of glorious youth. That's 200 for a human being. I went to Vienna exactly three years and four months ago. So you see, the uh, kitten part is Winkelberg's discovery. But they said in the papers it was human beings. I was helping him adapt it to human beings. And you succeeded, Mr. Baxter? Humphrey. All right, Humphrey. When will the stuff be ready? 30 years or so. It's a question of finding a new source for the extract. To get this stuff, we had to perform an extremely delicate operation, which uh, unfortunately is fatal to the animal we get it from. So you see... It's what ter animal? It's quite a common one. Man. Oh. Another source would take years even to test. That's why I swore you to secrecy. Can you imagine the panic that would break out on this planet if people knew there was just some in existence being kept... There is some, then. For the privileged few? Yes. The extract was made three times. Three? I took one. Uh, and there were three to begin with? Well? What about the others? Dingleberg took another one of the three. He's 68 and as ugly as a monkey. And he'll stay 68 and stay ugly for the next 200 years. Ugh. Who took the third? I brought the third back to America with me, Carolyn. Life, youth, love. For 200 years. I must admit, I nearly poured this away the day I landed. Oh, Humphrey. Oh, but I don't feel that way now that I've met you both. You're such a wonderful couple. And I want you to stay that way. That's why I'd like you to have this if you care for it. Oh, Humphrey. Here you are. For both of you. My wedding present. But you do solemnly swear never to say a word. I, I do. do. Sounds quite like the wedding service. <laughs> <laughs> but of course it isn't. We'll each take half. A hundred years apiece. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Hold on. I'm afraid I misled you. Why? You mean we can't take half each? My dear, glands don't understand arithmetic. A half-changed gland won't give you half of anything. No? <laughs> no, Carolyn. <laughs> you know, I remember when I first met you, I told you what people were like when certain glands were deranged. You mean those awful freaks? Exactly. There's just one dose in that little bottle. It can be drunk in one gulp. It has a slight flavor, but it's hardly unpleasant. Keep it as a curiosity. It, it isn't pretty. It's a wedding present. At least it's unique. <laughs> well, thank you, Baxter. Humphrey. 
to thank you, Humphrey. Oh, it's too wonderful. Really, Humphrey, you shouldn't. Don't you think so? thanking Humphrey very warmly again and again for his wedding present, Caroline and Alan went home where they set his interesting little bottle on the mantelpiece. It took many a long look at it. Many a long look at each other. You'd better take it now, darling. I'll do no such thing, Alan. I want you to drink it. Carolyn, look at yourself in there, in that mirror. I'm just being selfish. I want you to be like that forever. Look at yourself, Alan. That's how you've got to be, sweetie. Always. The next morning, the bottle was still there. Sweetie? Yes, love? It's impossible to say what there was in the tone of their voices that suggested that each one of them may have thought a bit about that bottle during the night. Darling. Now get this straight. Once and for all, you're going to take it and I'm not. But try to think of your overhead smash. What's wrong with my overhead smash? Are you trying to tell me it's not holding up? It's wonderful how it holds up. Everyone says so. But you'll be against that awful boy from California in August, you know. I could take care of that pipsqueak without any monkey glands. And I must say, I am rather surprised you think I can't. Oh, I don't think you can't, but... Darling, you are six years older than I am. The man's got ten years at least on a woman. Not every woman. Every woman. I think you look awfully distinguished with gray hair. I can't imagine you with gray hair. Alan, I couldn't bear to see you get old and ugly. I'd rather it was me. Oh, no, honey. But you would still love me even if I did get old, wouldn't you? Or would you? Carolyn, you know I would. I know you wouldn't. But I would you. That's what you think you'd better take it yourself. Go on, let me get old. Oh, I wish Humphrey had never given us the wretched stuff. Let's pour it down the sink. Are you crazy? The only bottle in the whole world? From what Baxter said, a man died for what's in that bottle. I guess he would be awfully hurt if we throw it away. After all, it's a wedding present. So they left Humphrey's little bottle on the mantelpiece, which is an excellent place for a wedding present to be. And the wonderful life of this wonderful couple went on, but Caroline became more and more exacting in the beauty parlor, and it was pathetic to see Alan hovering in front of the mirror as if to decide if that was only a sun-bleached hair on his temple, not a gray one. She watched him in the mirror, and he saw her watching him. What is it? Hmm? What's the matter? I was just looking at you. You're staring. Oh, my goodness. Most men, if they found me gazing at them, would think they'd died and gone to heaven. You're not gazing at me with love. You're, you're examining me for enlarged pores and wrinkles and sagging tissues. I've got a good mind to take this stuff and swallow it down right now. Yes, it's just the sort of thing you would do. Things went on like this until the last day of the tennis tournament when Brody encountered the boy Wonder from California who played him to a standstill. As they walked off the court, he put his hand on his shoulder. Hand of the victorious is a heavy load to carry. And that night, in spite of his aching weariness, Brody lay awake long after Carolyn was sound asleep. At last, he got up and crept with infinite caution into the living room where I'm sorry to say he drank the contents of Humphrey's bottle. He decided it might be better to do something about the taste. He found some cocktail bitters and added several drops to the water which he'd already put in the file. Then he...
put it back on the mantelpiece, and over the mantelpiece there was a mirror. Alan took a long look in this mirror, and he smiled. Now, it happened that in Caroline's play there was another part, supposedly her sister, and the actress playing his part walked out in a fit of temper. A new girl had to be found in a hurry, and the producer nominated the niece of a friend of his, and this new girl was a smash hit. Carolyn went home that night, the sound of this new applause ringing in her ears, and found the place empty. Now, the emptiness of one's own home at midnight can seem like an injury, and Carolyn took it as an injury. She looked at the largest of the framed photographs of Alan and felt somehow dissatisfied with his smile. It's not mature, she thought. And she looked in the mirror and tried, and it wasn't easy, a smile of her own. And this she found even less satisfactory. I might as well face it, said this veteran of 27. I'm old. She stood and watched her reflection, and in the stillness and silence of the apartment, she could feel and almost hear the remorseful erasures of time. Moment after moment, particles of skin wore away, hair follicles broke, splintered, and decayed like the roots of dead trees. All those little tubes and lines of thread-like chains in the inner organs were silted up like doomed rivers. And the glands, the all-important glands, were choking and clogging and falling apart. She thought her marriage was falling apart. And Alan would be gone. And life would be gone. So she drank the contents of the little bottle. She was very calm as she went to the bathroom and refilled the little bottle with water and added a little quinine to give it a bitter taste. And when Alan came home, she overwhelmed him with tenderness, feeling, of course, as if she'd betrayed him was going to desert him and go away into an endless springtime where he could never follow her. So time, which was the cause of all this trouble, went on, and both Caroline and Alan, secure in imperishable youth, saw in the others, through a magnifying glass, more and more of the hastening signs of decay. Alan began to feel that Caroline, at the very least, should have provided herself with a younger sister and one night he dropped into the theater and discovered that in a manner of speaking, she had done so. And all this time, Humphrey, being trained to await patiently the outcome of his scientific experiments, waited patiently. And then Caroline came to him. Humphrey, Humphrey, I've left Alan. These things happen? It's your fault. Oh? Well, maybe not yours exactly, but it was that horrible stuff you gave us. Oh, Humphrey. I'm the lowest kind of hypocrite and traitor. All of which means, I suppose, that you're the one that took the stuff. What did he say when you told him? He doesn't know. I filled the thing up with water and put some quinine in it. Tell me, why did you put quinine in it? To give it that bitter taste. I see. Well? Oh, I've tried so hard to love him more than ever to make up for it, but you just can't make up for a thing like that. Besides... Yes? You can't help watching a person who's aging in front of your eyes. And when you watch someone like that, you notice all sorts of things wrong with him. And it's all my fault, of course, because I just don't love him anymore. Maybe I never did. You've changed your mind about wanting to be young forever? Well, don't you? Not if I can't ever love anyone again. There's always yourself, of course. That's mean, Humphrey. Mean and cruel. Even if it's true. Well, it is lonely being like this. But then that's the price we pay for our little immortality. You and me and, of course, old Dingleberg. We're animals of a new species. There's us and the rest of the world. Of course, I used to think we were like that for quite a different reason. Oh, Humphrey, if we only... Oh, but I'm so unworthy. I let you down and 
Now I've let him down. The first was a mistake. It can be fixed. But not the second. Do you mean letting him down? We can't put that right. No, we can't live with that. Oh, I think so. You say the stuff tasted bitter. You're quite sure about that, I suppose. No. Oh, no, it was very bitter. You see, that has far-reaching implications. I used nothing but ordinary salt in the water. Orson Welles will be back in just a moment. Orchid and a man-eating tiger. Well, have you ever heard of a man-eating tiger orchid? No? Well, we're going to show you one on this program next week. The carnivorous posy is featured in something called Green Thoughts, which is a sort of spook story with a seasoning of giggles. I hope you enjoy it. Till then, I remain, as always, obediently yours.